All right. Well, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And uh, we just got through listening to Dr. Lee talk about the advancements of forensic science. And what I want to talk about are the, the people who respond to crime scenes who are looking for the evidence to bring to the crime lab to be processed. Um, in the last 45 years, um, I've been teaching uh, criminal justice students and police officers at the, in the academy in crime scene investigation. And it wasn't until uh, recently that, um, now that I work for the defense, my, my as a forensic consultant, I work for the defense and my job is to examine from the crime scene to the crime lab all that was done in, in a criminal case and to see what was done, not done, um, what evidence wasn't properly collected uh, um, and what, what evidence wasn't examined at all. And what I found out was with all the education and training that I had been doing for 45 years, it wasn't enough. Uh, it wasn't that, it isn't that um, the first responders, the police, the investigators, the medical examiners, it isn't that they're not trained and, um, and knowledgeable and skillful. It's they're not remembering to do all the things. There are basic standards that uh, should be done. And there's so many different things to be considered uh, that uh, many things are missed. So um, with that, um, I said, what can we do? Now we've been using checklists uh, for years, um, hard copy checklists, uh, but we have a new, uh, you know, today's uh, generation, um, they don't like hard copies. And by the way, I have to put this slide and anytime I talk about the, the CSI checklist, uh, uh, I have to make sure people understand that the checklist is a product of uh, Forensic IQ and not that of the University of Maryland, Maryland although the University of Maryland uh, certainly uh, understands the significance of it. So what I wanna do is tell you a little bit about the CSI checklist and why it's there and, 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 and why it's important. What is it? It's simply a, um, a, an application that's on Apple Store or uh, Google, uh, Google Play uh, that can assist law enforcement and any first responder uh, to a crime scene to ensure that they uh, understand the guidelines. So all the, all the guidelines in, um, that have been created in the various aspects of criminal investigation are actually in the checklist. So at three o'clock in the morning, if an officer is responding to a, um, a, a, a crime that they've never investigated before or haven't done it for a while, uh, they can go right to the uh, checklist uh, and to ensure that they never miss a step, that they never miss a question to be asked, uh, and never leave the crime scene without complete confidence that they uh, haven't haven't missed something. And and that's the important thing to make sure that that didn't happen. Now, a checklist. Uh, why is it important? Why are we even talking about it? Well, Doctor Atu. Gowande uh, wrote a book in 2010, and doc, uh, Dr. Gowande is a is a surgeon in um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, my home state. I, I'm I'm in Maryland right now, but my home state is Massachusetts. He wrote this book in 2010 called the Checklist Manifesto, and he was talking and he talks about the importance of all the professions to ensure that. Um, nothing happens. Now, checklists began with the aviation um, community. Um, planes were crashing, not because of mechanical um, uh, device errors, but human error, things that weren't checked before they took off. That's why it's so important for um, pilots uh, to go through a checklist to make sure everything is working properly. The medical community is now doing that. Uh, Dr. Gowande, um, in his research, realized that people were actually dying in the operating room, not for the reason why they were brought there for an operation, but mistakes in the room. Uh, I have a personal, a personal um, experience with that. Uh, my, my best friend's uh, uh, sister went in to have a cyst removed off of her shoulder 
Um, and her husband dropped her off at the hospital, said, I'll pick you up in a couple of hours. And uh, during that period of time, with a simple cyst, um, two different nurses injected her with a medication that instantly killed her. Uh, so now operating rooms uh, are using checklists. Do this quote that's uh, on the slide right now, I have to read it uh, because it, it, it's really important. It says, we need a different strategy for overcoming failure. The bottom line is criminal cases are not always um, made properly. People are being found not guilty. People who have committed crimes are being found not guilty. And many times it's because of something that wasn't done uh, or missed, et cetera. So he said, we need a different strategy for overcoming this failure. One that builds on experience and takes advantage of the knowledge people have. Again, knowledge, skills, the people who respond to crime scenes have all that knowledge and skills, but somehow also makes up for our inevitable human inadequacies. Those human inadequacies and inadequacies are that we just can't remember all the things that are important. And there is a strategy, though it will seem almost ridiculous in its simplicity, maybe even crazy to those of us who have spent years carefully developing ever more advanced skills and technologies. It's a checklist. And so when I looked at the criminal justice community and the forensic science community, I saw that although there's a lot of checklists out there, we didn't have one place to go. So a uniformed officer or investigator or a medical examiner or an arson investigator, uh, one, there was no one place while at the, uh, at the scene that they could go to ensure that they conduct their investigation in a manner and not forget anything. And uh, that it was the intent um, of creating this uh, checklist. Uh, these are the, uh, the, the old checklists that were used for years. Uh, you know, they're hard copy checklists. Uh, but what we have now um, is the CSI checklist. And in the checklist, uh, you have procedures uh, to perform, observations to be made. So if you're going to a scene of a, of a rape investigation and, and you never investigated a rape before, or you haven't done one for a long time, what are those observations that you need to be made? They're all listed in the checklist. Questions to be asked. What are the questions that need to be asked of the victim? All witnesses. What resources are available um, to you or the other players in the process uh, that can be called in. What are the actions taken that are shared? In other words, uh, we have multiple people coming to the crime scene and they all have their own, own responsibilities. How are we sharing that information? How do we know what the needs and the expectations of the other players are? For example, if you're a uniformed officer going to the scene of, of a crime, uh, do you know what the investigators are gonna need? Do you know what needs to be done to protect certain kinds of evidence um, that eventually a forensic uh, anthropologist or whatever might uh, be coming and by the time they come, has evidence been lost? Consistency in action performance. As a supervisor, if I have several investigators out there at the same time going to different scenes, as a, as a supervisor, what do I have to ensure that all my investigators are performing their job in the same way? So the same standards of service are being provided. And then last, confidence that no action has been missed. The key thing is when you're walking away with that, walking away from that crime scene, you can't go back. Uh, and the checklist helps you to uh, make sure that you don't miss anything. Um, who should use the checklist? Who is it helpful for? Well, there are five basic groups, obviously law enforcement, some people think when they see CSI checklists, oh, this is for the crime scene investigators. It's for a whole lot more of people. Uh, law enforcement, fire services, the medical services, the legal profession, and forensic sciences, all these players 
uh, are involved in the processing of a crime scene. And they need to know and understand each other's needs and expectations. The checklist helps them do that. So in law enforcement, uniform officers, investigators, crime scene investigators, and you're gonna, not you're gonna notice that I've put students in every one of these categories. If you're a student in law enforcement, fire services, medical, legal, or forensic sciences, this checklist can help as you're learning um, your career field. Um, fire services, uh, firefighters are putting a fire out and all of a sudden they realize that this is a sus suspicious fire. Ultimately, it may become uh, a crime, an arson, or, uh, or uh, an incendiary device where you're gonna call the bomb squad in. Um, if in fact, they believe that it could be uh, a criminal act, what do they need to do? What, uh, how, do they how can they protect the evidence so when the investigators come in, uh, they, you know, the checklist again has all these things. Uh, the medical folks, um, when, a, when we have a homicide, usually the ambulance crew gets there first uh, and pronounces the, uh, the victim um, deceased. Well, after they're done, they pick up all their equipment and walk out of the crime scene. Well, what did they pick up? What did they use? Are they walking away with evidence? Um, what should they do? Uh, what should they consider? Uh, so the ambulance crews, uh, forensic nurses who are now here, at least in America, uh, we have forensic nurses um, doing the medical legal examinations of, of sexual assault victims at the hospitals. And they need to know and understand what the investigator needs, what the crime lab needs from them when they're conducting their, their investigation. The legal area, you know, this, this kind of puts me out of a job, but um, every time I work for a defense attorney, uh, the, my job is to look at what was done and see if it was done properly, uh, what was missed. Well, the checklist tells them all that. They could literally use the checklist as they're, as they're going through their case file for their client. They can go through the checklist and see what was done, what wasn't done. So in my opinion, uh, both prosecutors and defense attorneys, this can be a valuable tool, uh, a quick tool. Again, everybody has a telephone uh, in their hand, in their pocket, in their purse. Um, and it'll always, and it's always there. And then obviously the last group, the, the forensic science, uh, science folks. So those are the, uh, the people that um, I think are the stakeholders uh, for the, uh, uh, the checklist. Now, there are 13 checklists right now, and these are them, and you can, you know, I'm not gonna read them for you, but let me just say to you that these, these numbers in yellow are the different uh, protocols, actions, observations and questions that need to be asked during the preliminary investigation, during the crime scene procedures, as you go down the line. For example, just if you respond to, um, to a call and you're conducting a prelim, pre preliminary investigation, there's 51 things that you need to think about to consider to do that job properly. Every one of those 51 um, actions are in the checklist. Uh, and you can see the numbers get higher and higher. And homicide, 125 different actions. Sexual assault, 144. The, the property crimes, a little bit less. Arson, 124. Uh, explosions in bomb scene investigations, 125 things to consider, questions to ask, observations to make. Electronic and digital evidence. You know, there isn't a crime scene nowadays that doesn't have electronic or digital evidence at it. 301 things that all these players who respond need to consider to do the job well and effectively. That's a lot of, a lot of responsibility to put on any group of people uh, and it's impossible to, to have that on the top of your mind. In the forensic science resources, uh, if I can click onto this, um, if you have a body, if you have human uh, scuttle remains, um, by the time somebody decides, hey, maybe we need a forensic anthropologist, they may have moved, moved the evidence and done things that affect 
the ability for the forensic anthropologists to do the right thing. So um, uh, the recovery and analysis of, of human scuttle remains um, for, for those first responders is at least 16 different things that they need to consider. Those, those 16 things are not on the, in, the, in their mind. Um, they may have talked about it when they went to the police academy, or they may even went to a forensic anthropologist course, but you can't possibly have that uh, right away without going somewhere to have it. In today's generation, as we all know, they would rather see an app than see a piece of paper, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, forensic botany, there's 12 things. These are all things that are actually in the uh, in, in the um, checklist. Question documents. Well, the question document examiner in the lab can't do their job unless the investigators uh, in the offices bring to them the, the proper documents, the proper standards. Uh, do they know how to uh, uh, obtain standards? Um, that is in a checklist. Forensic entomology you know, the study of insects and the relationships to humans, the environment and other organisms. Um, when do you call for an, a forensic entomologist? And in most cases, you're gonna be asked yourself to collect these things. How do you collect them? It's all there uh, in the checklist. Last one, forensic locksmithing. I, uh, I uh, never knew there was such thing as forensic locksmithing until I had a discussion with my cousin who is a forensic locksmith. He's, a, well, he has a locksmith company, but he has been called in on several criminal cases in Massachusetts where uh, his examination of locks have been able to um, provide investigators with valuable information on determining um, whether a certain um, uh, action was criminal or not. So, the, all these uh, different type of forensic sciences are in the checklist and um, it keeps on going. Uh, the um, ASPCA, the, the Association for uh, Animals um, in the United States, they found out about the checklist and said, you know, we created a checklist for law enforcement and we don't know if anybody's using it. Um, during the day, during normal business hours, Monday through Friday, we have animal officers who are specialists in, in, in um, responding to um, animal abuse cases and neglect cases. But after hours and on weekends, um, regular uniform officers are responding and they do not know how to handle these cases. So they asked me if I would, I would take their um, checklist that they they had created if in integrated into the uh, checklist. So uh, there's 108 things to consider when responding to an animal abuse or negligent case in the in the raw there. And so if the officer has never done one of these before, he or she can go to that checklist and in, correct. Uh, missing persons, abductions, runaway child, um, I added that this past year. And the last one, the last checklist that I added was hate and bias crimes. Um, in the United States, um, you know, they have created specific uh, criminal um, charges and acts for hate and bias crimes. And uh, you need to be very specific in understanding what, um, you know, what constitutes a hate or bias crime. Uh, what type of evidence uh, are you looking for to be able to prove these cases? Um, uh, what kind of questions do you need to ask the, uh, um, the victims, uh, the people who believe they've been victimized? So there's 215 of those types of uh, things. So uh, right now there's 13 uh, separate uh, checklists there that um, uh, uh, can be uh, can be used. Now, as the person who's responding and using the checklist, as they're going down and and looking at each uh, each item, if they touch it, it puts a check on it. So at the end, uh, in reference to quality control, um, it creates a document. This is an example of the document. Everything that they've checked. Um, will create a document and that document can be sent to their supervisor. More importantly, 
it can be used by that person when they're writing the report. One of the things that I'm seeing when I'm analyzing a case for a defense attorney is that a lot there are a lot of things done by the responder, whether it be a, a police officer or an investigator or evidence technician or a medical examiner, a lot of things that they did are they observed, but they didn't put it in their report. So when I look at a report and say, hey, there's a, a number of things that should have been done or looked at, but it doesn't say it in the report, that gives an opportunity for the defense attorney to ask. So uh, this document uh, that is automatically created uh, can be used to write their report. It can be used, it, it can be immediately emailed to your uh, supervisor. So if you're a supervisor and you have multiple people out there uh, working at the same time, while they're at the scene and they, they can use the app and then they can immediately send what they did, what they observed, what they considered, um, they can send it to, to the supervisor and they can uh, see that. So quality, it's a, it's a quality control tool also that I think um, uh, can really, really make a difference. The last thing it is, is a training tool. Uh, police officers, TV makes everybody believe in the public that police officers go from one call to the next call to the next call to the next call. There's a lot of downtime uh, many times for uh, police officers. And again, all police officers nowadays, they have a cell phone in their hand. They, it might be a department a cell phone. It could be a personal cell phone. Bottom line is they have, they, they can use the, the app as a training tool. Uh, a supervisor can say, okay, this evening, I want everybody to look at um, a checklist on, on uh, hate crimes. Um, we want to talk about and make sure that you know what to consider, what to ask, and what evidence is important to, to make those kind of cases. So um, a training tool uh, is something that, it, that can really, really make a difference. So that is what it is. Now, what I, you know, when I've, I've talked to police chiefs around the, uh, the country and the first thing that comes out of their, you know, their mouth is, well, my, my investigators are trained. And this is not suggesting that, that, that professionals are not trained. It's not a question of them not knowing it. It's a question of making sure they don't forget it or miss it. It's a, you know, a human fact that we cannot remember all these things. Uh, and plus, if, if we're doing the same thing over and over and over, we tend to get lax in that. Um, and the checklist just helps that. Um, there is no other checklist like this specifically. Now, you might ask, uh, where are these, um, where are these uh, items coming from? The, uh, the United States Department of Justice has created standards um, for all these all these things, and they're out there. Uh, but again, who's using them? Don't know. So I've taken all the national standards that the Department of um, of Justice has created that said, "Hey, we've talked to all the experts in all these different fields, whether it be death investigation, um, uh, um, sexual assault, uh, robbery." Uh, larceny, whatever it might be. And these are the things that are important. These are the steps that should be taken. These are the questions that should be asked um, each time um, a, a case is done. So in my opinion, as a professor and somebody who's been teaching people for 45 years, um, this is a tool uh, that can help. And this is something that anybody can create um, in no matter what country you are, I don't care where you are, uh, the basic standards that are in here are the same for anybody. And of course, different jurisdictions will have additional things that, that are important. Um, but I believe uh, this is an opportunity to get all, all of them in one place. And uh, as new ideas come, I will simply add, add to them. That's my story and I'm sticking with it. Let me get 
back to here. I, I don't know if there's any questions, but I would love to take any questions if, if there are.